What's up, y'all? It's Shuffle, and we're going to be doing another guide. Today, we are talking about the Flagellant, everyone's favorite hooded, mace-wielding, shirtless, come-at-me-bro hero, for lack of a better word. I don't think he's that heroic, but I guess anyone facing monsters should be considered heroic. So, we're going to talk about the Flagellants, and before we get into the strengths, weaknesses, teams, and skills, and all the normal stuff that you're probably here for, the Flagellant has a lot of unique stuff that we're going to talk about, and I'm just going to paraphrase the wiki here, but you should definitely go check that out, because it has the, you know, the full wording, it's a short little six-point paragraph, and so the first major important point of the Flagellant is he can never go virtuous. So when you get to 100 stress with a hero, they have a chance to go virtuous or get afflicted. The base chance is 25% for virtuous, I believe, and so you pretty much have like the, the one in four to get the good one, but the Flagellant cannot go Virtuous. He always goes Afflicted, or gets Afflicted, and his Affliction is unique. It is called Rapturous, and it is still an Affliction, so don't get it twisted. He will still do things like hit your party members, or use random skills, and you lose control of them, or he'll move, and you don't want to deal with those things if you can... If you can help it, so we don't like the Razor's Edge play style, at least I don't. We'll talk about it more in depth later. But when he is afflicted, because sometimes you're playing it uh, no light or something, or you're on a really tough boss that's putting out a lot of stress, and he gets afflicted, it's actually still one of the better afflictions outside of the, the negatives. So when he is afflicted with Rapturous, he gets 25% bonus damage, he gets an extra 3 speed, and he loses 20 dodge. His base dodge is already pretty low at 20. So at that point, he's just not getting out of the way of anything. If you have the ability to camp, you can actually knock this off somewhat easily. He does have a camp skill that knocks off 50 stress. So we'll get camp skills later. The next quirk, for lack of a better word about him, is that when he goes under 40% hit points, he gets a buff for 20% damage and 7% crit. His base damage at 5 to 11 is pretty low, so all of these damage bonuses do add up, but in the grand scheme of things, I don't feel that they're... Uh, as powerful as the crit in this case, or like some of the other supplemental stuff. So if you get everything, like if he's afflicted and at death door, then he does have a lot of extra damage, but that playstyle, again, is pretty unsafe, so we try to avoid it. But for the, the one or two turns, he's probably gonna be there with that combination. It's actually solid. So he gets the bonus damage and the crit, and then as I was saying before, when he hits death door, he heals everyone in the party for 10% of their max hit points, and then he gets another buff of 5 accuracy, 20% damage, 2 speed, and then he gets 20% stun, bleed, blight, and debuff resist. Which is all pretty good. That makes him really hard to kill at Death's Door. The extra speed lets him go first so he can get an attack off. Like, all of this bonus speed is helpful because his base speed is 9. So when he gets low health, Death's Door, stuff like that, he's going to be rocking maybe 11 speed. Or if you have uh, something else like the Heart Burst Hood, he can get up to, what, 15 speed? He's pretty much going first, that guarantees your exsanguinate so he can help himself survive. So there is a lot of defensive factors that he has that helps to keep him alive, but keep in mind he can still die from a heart attack if he's a Death Door. I learned that the hard way. Of note about Death Door as well is the Flagellant does not get the recovery debuff, so the grayed out skull that your other heroes do, which means via Death Door and he comes back off it, he's gonna be fine. So he's kind of designed that way. He needs to like get really hurt get low, uses good things, get healed up so he doesn't have the big risk of dying, and then get knocked down again. So, <laughs> he gets knocked down, and he gets up again, and you're never going to keep him down. That's just the flagellant. If he does die, he stuns the entire enemy party, but the base stun chance is 125%. I wish this was higher, because losing a hero is huge. Like, you don't lose 25% of your effectiveness, you lose something close to, like, 50% of your effectiveness, just because there's this concept of the death spiral in darkest dungeon and also your party members don't get corpses in the base game so if people are dying then they're getting pulled up so they can't keep their position it gets much harder but yeah the concept of death spiral is the more heroes or whatever more characters the player is losing the harder the game gets like almost at an exponential level so you lose one person it gets very difficult to finish I mean, the fight, let alone the dungeon. You lose two, you're probably thinking about retreating at that point, unless you're, like, right at the end of the fight, the last fight or something. 
The Flagellant will only use the Penance Hall for a stress relief activity, but this always full heals him, so it's pretty awesome. Unless you have the Town is a Buzz event, which gives him a little penalty, but pretty much it's always a full heal, so. It's worth the money, even though it is the most costly thing out there besides the Brothel. Uh, so just keep that in mind. I would instead look to bring him on a camping mission to hit the, the camp skill that lowers 50 stress if you want to save some money. And the last unique point of the Flagellant is you cannot take more than one. Which makes sense because if you had two and they're just spamming Reclaim on each other and healing each other when they started dying, it would probably be pretty broken. I'm actually curious if there's a mod out there that takes this restriction off because I would like to test it. Alright, now we can talk about the normal stuff. The strengths are pretty numerous with the Flagellant. Like, on paper, he's amazing, and before he got nerfed pretty hard, I would say he was an S-tier class. Like, when Crimson Core dropped, he was <laughs> pretty busted, but, you know, we're not playing that version of the game anymore. So, to start off, he has base 9 speed. That's really good. That lets him get out ahead of a lot of enemies. It lets him get out ahead of the frontliners that he's up against, in most cases. So, if he gets low and he gets hurt and stuff, it's... Uh, he has a good chance of going first and using those redeems, those exsanguinates, or whatever else is happening to save him. You know, use a bandage, that kind of thing. So the base 9 speed is awesome, and as he gets more hurt, it goes up, which is good. And since he can double as a support with his heals and such, having really high speed helps him keep everyone else healthy and whatever. So we like the base 9 speed because speed is never a bad stat. The Flagellant is a strong frontline bleeder. The only other one that's really good at it that comes to mind is the Hellion. She has a couple bleed skills for the front. And Hellion usually likes rank 1, so usually you pick between one of them, but you can put them together. Highwayman kind of goes wherever he wants. He has Open Vein, that's a good bleed skill. Houndmaster can be in rank 2, 3, 4, 1 if you're feeling kind of nutty. But he has a lot of bleeds and the stuns and the other support things, so there's a lot of bleed synergy if you want to go that route. You can have someone at each rank effectively doing some strong bleeds. And this is good against certain enemies that have multiple actions per turn. There are a couple mini bosses, there are a couple bosses. I'm looking at you, Countess, who have multiple actions. So being able to bleed them out is a lot of extra effective damage, especially if you're landing crits. So if you're looking for that kind of thing, he's good at it. And this is outside of all his other good stuff that we're about to discuss. He has great support skills, he can act as an off healer between Reclaim and Redeem, he can act as a stress healer with Endure, and all of these don't really impede on his normal gameplay. Also Suffer, I forgot to mention that. You should usually take Punish, but then you can take one or two of his other attacks, and then you can still slot in something to support, so he's always just there to provide extra healing. You know, Redeem is actually a really good skill for that, because even if you have this big damage loadout, you know, you have Punish, Reign of Sorrows, Exsanguinate, then you can just have Redeem. And it's like, if the Flagellant just happens to be hurt, you just see someone in the back at half hit points, you go, sure, I'm just gonna heal you almost to full, that's fine. It's a percentage heal too, which is very strong. So he's like this really good frontline damage dealer with the bleeds, if they can bleed, so you're not taking him to the ruins for the most part, unless you're making a video about it. And then he just has this subtle support thing on the back burner, which I like a lot. I like those kinds of heroes. The Crusader does that too, where Crusader can have like a couple good things, like his direct hit, Holy Lance, his stun, but then you have other support things. And it's just there, it's not a detriment. So we like that. As the game becomes more difficult, the Flagellant becomes stronger. I don't know if there's a better way to word that, but what I mean is as he gets hurt, he becomes stronger. As he becomes afflicted, he becomes stronger. And a lot of the hardest fights in the game will push you to these moments. In a lot of the cases, when you get afflicted, it's pretty much bad for anyone else. It's still kind of bad for him, but it's like not the end of the world. And as he gets hurt in terms of hit points, he becomes stronger because he can use all of his other abilities. So for instance, if you crit Exsanguinate, that's like 60 damage. It's ridiculous. Redeem, being able to heal two people for big chunks is nice. Being able to reclaim whenever you want on the other heroes is a good ability. So he's really good as the content gets harder, and that's always something to keep in mind. The Flagellant was released alongside the Crimson Court DLC, or as part of it I should say, and as such, he matches up very well against those enemies. I would even go so far as to say he kinda dominates them. Like, he just matches up so well 
in a lot of the cases, a lot of the Crimson Court enemies are kind of fast. They're faster than you'd think. So he's good against that. They all bleed. He does bleed. They have the potential for high burst damage. He can heal if there's burst happening. So he's just really good in that instance. And even in the cove where bleed resist is higher, you know, you're probably looking at 80%, 100%, maybe 120. I can't remember, like, every single enemy in there. But he can still bleed those. It's really just the ruins that he can't bleed in. So that's really the only spot you're not going to take him consistently. You know, you can still do it. Get the direct damage and more of a support setup. And then hope you run into a lot of bandits and spiders. But otherwise, he's pretty good to use in a lot of spots. And he's really good in Crimson Court, which is one of the hardest uh, areas in the game. The final point is he has some pretty solid resists, most notably the bleed resist, which is much higher than average at max level. His bleed resist is up to 125% against champion level enemies. Their bleed chances are usually about 140, so he's only got a 15% chance to bleed at that point. And this matters because Reclaim does have a very high chance to bleed him. It's still about 35-40% even with his massive bleed resist, so you need something like the Flesh Heart to get him over the edge. But bleed is a very common damage type, and some of the strongest attacks are bleed. So, for instance, Arterial Pinch, that's a huge bleed. The Finger, that's a big bleed. And we're not trying to die to those. So having the Flagellant in those cases is very helpful. You almost don't have to give him a bleed charm in a lot of cases, or a bleed resist charm. Shrink it. Keep calling him charms. Now it's time to talk about the weaknesses for the Flagellant. As I was discussing earlier, the low base damage is pretty important to note. So if they can't bleed or if your bleeds are getting resisted, his damage really falls off. And even though he can increase it by large amounts with all of these bonuses, I think he gets up to like 10, you know, like 10 to 22 or something like that, depending on what you have, which is pretty solid damage. But, you know, he has to be a death store with like a cork or a trinket to get Hellion damage or Crusader damage. And that's like, eh... So you're really looking for those bleeds. So if they can bleed, his damage is good, but his raw on hit damage is pretty lacking. His base dodge is 20, which is just garbage. That's up there with all of the uh, the other tank classes like Crusader and stuff. They have base 20. And dodge is, you know, it's an RNG mechanic, so it's not the worst thing that it's low. But the fact that when he's afflicted, it goes to zero, which pretty much gives him almost no chance to dodge anything. That sucks. You don't want him getting hit by everything when he's like you know, in danger, which is what Raptures is going to be. He's in danger, and you don't want to have him not dodging anything at that point because it's easier to heart attack. So the low dodge is pretty bad. He has low base hit points. His max is 38, which it is it is a weakness because it's still low base hit points. He doesn't have many ways to raise it outside of trinkets and quirks, and it does help him activate his low hit point thing sooner, but low hit points is still a weakness. I'd rather have like 50 hit points and have more wiggle room, more time to spend in my low hit point area so I can not be as afraid of dying. So the low hit points, it's just, it's never good, even though he does get stronger in those instances. So it's still a weakness. Bonus healing effects like Hippocratic or trinkets that increase raw healing output do not help reclaim, which means you can't really do this awesome healer setup the healing bonuses do help exsanguinate and redeem so that's something to look forward to but those are limited use and since it doesn't help reclaim you're looking at healing received instead which kind of sucks because that way you can't do the raw healing output flagellant like you can't do punish with reclaim redeem and endure or suffer and then use like the ancestor scroll because that would be a really fun setup, but you just... It, you can do it, but it's not that effective since Reclaim doesn't get the bonus. Rapturous is still an Affliction. I talked about it earlier. And it's still bad. Like, you never want to get Afflicted if you can help it. As I was saying, there's a lot of negatives that come with it. He still attacks other people. He still uses random stuff. Sometimes you lose control of him. And once he's at 100 stress, it's easier to get higher stress. You get up to 200. And even with 87 death blow, he is not surviving a heart attack if he's at zero. It's just not, you can't do it, right? So that means that Rapturous is still bad. You want to avoid it if you can, but as I was saying, it's not bad. It's not the end of the world if it happens, even though the Flagellant's acting like it's the end of the world. And we're going to try and avoid Rapturous if possible. The final point is probably the biggest, and that is the Razor's Edge playstyle that he's designed for is bound to fail at some point. 
Darkest Dungeon is a game that has a lot of variants, and the key to success in Darkest Dungeon, for you new players who are wondering how to improve your game, the core concept is to try and limit as much variance as possible. So that's why you play things that like highlight or favor accuracy over crit chance, because you're trying to limit all of the negative RNG coming into you. And playing the Razor's Edge Flagellant is very dependent on this RNG. His death blow caps out at 87, so even if you have all that, you still have a 13% chance of dying. That's pretty like easy to do. A lot of the enemies at max level, their base crits around 10, 13, 15%. So think about how often you're getting crit by the enemy. And then think about all those as your flagellant dropping dead. And even though it's a viable strategy, it's just not one you want to deal with because of all the things we were talking about before, like the death spiral, losing a hero, the on-death effects aren't really worth it for him. Him going to death door is okay because it heals everyone, but then coming off death door and going back, you can keep healing people. But otherwise, leaving him at death door, leaving him afflicted, it just too much can go wrong. And if he dies, it's like, okay, he's gone, right? It's not, he doesn't show up back in town two weeks later, he's just gone. And you're just praying for a resurrection town event at that point. That being said, we do want to avoid the Razor's Edge. And now we're going to talk about the skills pretty quickly. I don't want to spend too much time on them because I know you have eyeballs and you can read. Starting off with Punish, I feel the skill is amazing. It does really high bleed, it has no damage penalty, it has a huge crit modifier even though he has low base crit, and it synergizes with other bleeds by lowering their resist. I think this should be on every Flagellant build, like no questions, just because he needs an attack. I've played Flagellant builds that only use the back four abilities, so Reclaim, Redeem, Endure, and Suffer, and they really stall out when you get down to the last couple enemies, or if he has no one to heal. Like, if he has nothing to do on his turn, you're just wasting it, or like, you just hit another Reclaim, even though you have like two stacks on people, and it's just not that good. So, having Punish just gives him something to do, and it's his best attack, I feel, besides Exsanguinate, because Exsanguinate's a special case, so... Use Punish. Should be on every build. Reign of Sorrows, as it is, is actually a really good ability. Has a pretty modest damage penalty at two-thirds, and then it lowers bleed resist again. This helps all your other bleeds synergize, so Houndmaster's very happy. And then the bleed damage at five points is really nice. Big crit modifier, good base accuracy too. So the Reign of Sorrows is a great move. You can have this on every flagellant build if you want. You can also get rid of it if you have a lot of backline killing specialists in your team. But otherwise, not 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 a bad ability. Man, I'm talking too quickly. Exsanguinate is our first low health ability. It is honestly nuts. It is the sure you can bleed uppercut that comes with some healing penalties and a debuff that I don't believe you can use medicinal herbs to get rid of anymore. It's like it's got that red arrow on it, which means you can't cleanse it. But it heals the flagellant for half his life. The heal can crit and he's just at full health again. And if the punch, the exsanguinate punch, if that crits, that is 45 damage in bleed alone. It has no damage penalty on the raw hits, so this can crit and do upwards of 60 damage if they don't have prot or depending on other stuff. This is nuts. This is so good against enemies that have multiple actions. So if you're fighting a boss, again, I'm not going to try and spoil them, but there are some boss out there that have multiple turns that the flagellant matches up pretty well against. And if they just knock him down and he hits this crit, like, it, it's almost done. It's... A lot of bosses have about 200 hit points, maybe less depending on what you're fighting. And there are a couple other cases that have above that, but otherwise, it's just doing a ton of damage for one move. And you get to use it three times a battle. So if you can stack a lot of crit, I'm looking at you, Jester. I'm looking at you, Ancestor's Pen, if you really want to do it. This move can be a really good boss killer, so consider it, right? But if you're not going boss killing, this is actually the worst of the two, I think in terms of uh, usefulness for the low health abilities, I think Redeem just has more use. And that's because it heals other people. And if you're just punching hallway monsters with Exsanguinate, you're not gonna get the full effectiveness. So as good as it is as a boss killer, I think it's kind of mediocre as a, just a regular mission ability. Reclaim is fantastic. I slept on this move for the longest time, but it's a guaranteed 12 heal, but then each individual tick can crit and that gives you stress off. The other nice part about this is it's preemptive healing since it's a heal over time effect. So if your flagellant can't reach anyone, or if he has nothing to do on his turn, you can just hit reclaim on someone because you're expecting them to take damage. Or you can hit it on like the last turn of a battle if you know you have another battle coming like on the next tile. You know, like we're gonna say you're in the hallway, you're right before a door, you do a fight, last turn, you hit 
reclaim on someone, you walk into the next room, then there's a battle, and then you already have a heal going. It's a really good ability. The bleed chance is pretty strong against him. It has a moderate chance to bleed him, unless you use the Flesh Heart or something else to mitigate it. And it's still not the end of the world, even though it has a huge bleed effect, because it activates his low health abilities, but it's still 15 points of bleed, which is very painful, even for him. And this move doesn't really get good until like the end game, because the heal gets stronger and the bleed gets more manageable and you have more ways to block it. When you're starting out, his bleed resist is very... It's lower, obviously, it's 60% lower, you know, and it goes up by 10, what have you. And the bleed chance is still massive, and since you can't mitigate it as easily, and the heal's only like 2-3 points at that time, it's not that great, but at level 6, at level 6, Reclaim becomes very good. So if you're low level, probably avoid it, use Exsanguinate, use Reign of Sorrows, but when you're high level, or if you have like bleed resist charms, trinkets, keep saying it, then it becomes very good. Supplemental healing is never bad on your team, you know, your vessel can't do it alone. If you think about it, there's four people swinging into your team every turn, and the Vessel's not going to outheal all that damage. And having someone else that can heal, get you off Death's Door at 9 speed, by the way, the base speed, is just good. The Flagellant and Reclaim are very useful as uh, support in your teams, especially in the front line. There's not too much in the way of frontline support. Redeem is nuts. You only get two shots of it, but it heals a ton. You're doing effectively about half health on two characters, and it's percentage based, so this is awesome for your Crusaders, your Lepers, your Man at Arms, those people that have, you know, massive hit point pools that the Vestal, you know, dropping 11 points a turn is not going to keep up with too well and get them topped off in a timely fashion. So we like Redeem. It's great in a pinch. I think this is the other ability that should be on every Flagellant build. So it should just be Punish, Redeem, and then two other things you're looking for. And that's because there are just times when you use Redeem, you don't know exactly when you're going to need it, but you're going to be like, I'm low health. Hey, look at you, Highwayman, you're also at half health, and you just hit Redeem. And it's such a high, high value heal, and it's only got two uses per battle, so... When it goes off, it's amazing. And even in those long encounters where you're going to use both of them and then wish you had a third, it's still very helpful. It's just amazing healing output. Endure is pretty good as a stress heal. As the tooltip indicates, you're netting uh, about 8 effective stress healing. And then you also get 3 speed. I don't even know why it has a speed buff. It's pretty solid as is. So if you just want to keep using it, you keep getting yourself some extra speed. And this is better paired with some other stress healer that can just, you know, tap the, the flagellant on occasion. So the Jester and Crusader come to mind. There's uh, Houndmaster. There's a lot of synergy there with Cry Havoc. Flagellant takes people's stress off, gives it to himself, gets stress healed by something a little more efficient, and he gets a speed buff. It's just a really good move. And you could slot this in most builds and be happy with it. If something changed in the, the video right there, I just realized that I had Darkest Dungeon in the background, and I was mousing over it that way, so I just put it in the foreground. So I think that brings my mouse cursor back, and we're gonna talk about Suffer. This is probably the hardest move to use for Flagellant, just because it's, it's a weird, niche of things like I there's no other ability that does something like this it does so much and then it just feels like it does nothing at the same time so suffer will clear marked or bleeds or blights off other heroes and they will give them to the flagellant so if your vessel gets hit with arterial pinch the flagellant can say hey I got it and he'll just take the the damage instead which has its pros because that lets the Flagellant get hurt and activate his other abilities a lot easier, a lot more easily, I should say. But also, his high speed lets him just remove stuff from people before they get to go, which is nice. So instead of your Vestal taking the 10 points from the pinch, it's gonna be Flagellant instead, and then he'd rather take the bleed than her. At the same time, it also marks him, which is pretty dangerous. There are a lot of enemies that have Mark's energy, but then also if you're using Mark to tank, Mark is pretty weak to use as a tanking ability opposed to guarding someone because for some reason when the enemy marks me it always feels like they're trying to kill me when I mark myself the enemy's like yeah that's cool and they just do whatever they want and go after other people so that's just anecdotal evidence but there's some good synergy with suffer and endure because you get the big minus 40% stress uh, buff so you can hit that hit endure hit suffer hit endure and then you're just taking like two stress at that point which is really nice and then it gives them some death blow resist. If you're pairing this with 
a Martyr Seal or the Eternity Caller, or if you have Unyielding, for instance, as a Quirk, this caps you. And that's really awesome. So Suffer is probably the hardest ability to use. I have used it, or I find myself wanting to use it the least. And I find myself never really getting full effect out of it. But it can be effective. You just have to pick your spots. So this is probably the easiest one to get rid of if you're not going to use uh, an ability and you want to use something else. The Flagellant does not get the base three camping skills that everyone gets. So encourage pep talk and I believe wound care. He doesn't get those. He just gets all of his own stuff because I guess he's focusing on himself. So the first one is Lash's Anger. One point to give himself 40 stress. You're like, why do I want to give him stress? Well, it's because maybe you want Rapturous. I still think it's bad. At one point, it's about as fair as it's going to be. And if it was zero, I still probably wouldn't use it. Unless I wanted to hit that. Like, the only time I feel like I hit this is if I want to hit Lash's Anger and then use Lash's Solace so I can spend four points and do nothing. But otherwise, Lash's Solace is good. This used to be, I think, one point, which was busted. At three points, remove 50 stress. This is why we don't care if the Flagellant gets afflicted because if you have another stress healer in the team, you just tap him a couple times with those heals and then you camp. You just hit Lash's Solace and he's done. And this also synergizes with the Vestal's camp skills because he is a religious class. I forgot to talk about that. So Vestal has a couple things that reduce stress and give prot if you're religious, or the bonuses are bigger if you're religious, and Flagellant likes those. So he has some synergy there, and he has a lot of ways to get his own stress off. You know, when I say a lot of ways, I mean <laughs> one. So, uh, let's talk about Lash's Kiss. A self-heal for a third of his life, really nice. Extra speed, really nice. Takes off uh, status effects. Very nice. Worth three points, but usually if you're using the, the feast, it's so like the eight food camping, you don't really need to heal unless you're playing in like darkness or something and your heroes are just on death's door repeatedly, then this is pretty good. But otherwise, uh, if you need the extra heal and the speed primarily, then this is worth hitting. Lash's Cure is one of my favorites because any hero that can remove disease, I just love it. This saves you a lot of money in the long run if you plan around it because sometimes you get a really bad disease you know, at the end of a dungeon, when you don't have your camping, and you're like, oh, that sucks. But you know you're going to take him out again, you know? He has, like, you know, 10 stress, and you want to take him out again to the Warrens or something, like a medium mission. And you can just take him there and camp kind of early in the dungeon and then cure it. It's not a big deal. And as I said, if you actively look for this, this saves you thousands of gold over a playthrough. And that's just for him. So if you're using him a lot, he's getting diseased a lot because he likes to go to the Warrens, then uh, this is very powerful. Now it's time to talk about trinkets. We're gonna start with the farmstead one. The acidic husk iker, I think, is just terrible. The reason being the minus hit points is just so detrimental. I don't even know if it's worth using just for that alone. Because this is almost 10 hit points, right? He has 10, or no, he has 40 base HP. So losing a quarter of that's about 10. I think it comes out to like eight. And it's just not good. The 30% flat damage is okay, but you have to remember he has very low base damage, so this is putting him to like 7 to 14 or something, so that's like backline damage at that point. And as we were talking about, his damage comes from his bleeds, not his raw on-hit effects. But if you're looking to use this and Slugger and a Martyr Seal and sit at Death's Door, then yes, you might reach Leper damage. Congratulations, you did it, but I don't think it's worth using. Actually, we should talk about the last two things. So, the healing received if low hit points is, like, it's good. But at the same time, you're lowering your max HP because you want to use your low health skills faster. But then you're increasing your healing received, which gets you back to high hit points, which is like, I'm trying, I'm using this to stay at low HP, and then this is making me go back to high HP. It's, it doesn't seem too synergistic with itself, but it's still... Not bad to be able to heal yourself back up and stay safe, but it's just, it, I, I just don't like it. I, I can't give you a better reason than it's not that synergistic to me, and the penalties are just too great. Then the last thing to talk about it is the bleed chance for the husk. I am not a fan of such a specialized enemy damage thing. So if you're never going to the farmstead, you're losing one line of buffs on this uh, this four line thing for the, the tooltip. So husks themselves aren't mega threatening either, you know, in the, the farmstead. Like, as time goes on, the farmstead just becomes more threatening. That's just the nature of it. 
but the husks themselves are not as threatening as the the other enemies that pop up, like the unclean giants. You know, getting two unclean giants in a farmstead roll is a nightmare, and this just doesn't help you with that. So I think the husk hiker is pretty bad, and I think I've spent too much time talking about it. We're talking about the crimson quartz set here, since it's at the top. The chip tooth is okay. 20% max HP is nice. The move resist is bad, move resist is the worst resist, just because the person behind you can get pulled in front of you anyway, and it doesn't matter. So move resist is bad. The set bonus is also bad, 10 death blow for what you're trading off. Like, I can get 10 death blow in a lot of other sources. I can get a quirk, I can get a martyr seal, I can get the eternity caller, and it's just kind of a lackluster set to have. Because the shard of glass is Probably the worst Crimson Court trinket in the game. I'd have to double check. I think the Jester has some really bad ones too, but the increased bleed skill chance does let your bleeds go through on a lot of things. You know, if you're trying to bleed those skeletons, you're just getting that much closer. But between that and the minus bleed resist, this means Reclaim is pretty much unusable because you're always going to hit it. Like, this is effectively plus 55% chance to Reclaim bleed. That is painful. So as such, I think this is just a bad set. The Chip Tooth is like, okay if you get it early and you just want some raw hit points, but even then the Martyr Seal is just better. So, just a bad set. I would not go hunting for this. I actually get upset when I see it pop up in the, the loot pool. I'm like, I don't want that. Or if I get it from a, a boss drop, like, uh, please. The Eternity's color is pretty good. I think the Martyr Seal is better, but this gives the Flagellant his dodge back when he's at Death's Door. No, it's when he's afflicted, he loses dodge, so... If he's afflicted and at death's door, then he has, like, normal dodge, which is okay. But you're getting 10 death blow, which is nice. You're getting dodge when you need it most, which is nice. And then you're getting extra damage if you're afflicted, pretty much. Because 85 is almost afflicted, so we're just going to consider it afflicted. And it's pretty good. So, if you know you're going to be doing a lot of, or dealing with a lot of stress, or a lot of raw hit point damage on your flagellant, this is okay to use. But this is not something I'm going hunting for. This isn't like my week 7 boss kill trinket that I'm looking for, if you know what I'm saying. Suffering's Collar I like a lot, because when he's low hit points, it makes it very hard for him to get uh, status effects like Bleed and Blight, which is pretty much when you're trying to avoid them, because you don't want to die to those at Death's Door. And then it gives him 10% max HP, which is just good. Bonus hit points is never bad, and it does give you an extra hit before you can use your low health abilities in most cases, but, you know, the, the chance to survive because of it, I think, very much outweighs that. The Punishment Hood is pretty good early. This really helps your low health abilities and damage and get your bleeds to stick, but this also boosts the Reclaim Bleed against yourself, which does kind of suck, and the lowered healing skills, consequently, does not apply to Reclaim, but it does apply to Exsanguinate and Redeem, and I'd rather use a bleed amulet over this if I can help it because I don't want to penalize my uh, my redeem or my exsanguinate. I like those too much to take a minus 20% for. But if you get it early, still good to use. Resurrection's color kind of has this weird synergy if you want to use it with the, the punishment hood. Like you get a bunch of net gains instead of penalties. So there's that weird combination there. But this isn't that good just because the minus bleed skill chance does help with reclaim we like that but the raw healing output doesn't apply to reclaim so that does suck so really if you're just looking for a very supportive flagellant this can be okay because between this and a bleed resist trinket i think that makes reclaim almost effectively zero at lower levels i have to double check the math but this makes your healing output pretty solid for the two times you're going to use extent or redeem and the three times you're going to use exsanguinate so the reason this isn't that good for the healing is because those skills are limited uses but it is nice to not uh, bleed yourself when using reclaim especially if you have other heroes lowering bleed resist for you the heart burst hood i actually think is one of his best go figure and it's only a common trinket the four speed when low health is just awesome this lets you go first almost guaranteed when you get to low health if you don't have any other penalties going on because that's when you need to go first so you don't die to something you can use redeem you can use exsanguinate or if you're low health and someone else is low health you can use uh, reclaim so this is a really good one if you get it early it's pretty safe to slap on at all times because going first is just never bad flagellant quirks are pretty universal i feel 
because his builds are almost similar in how they operate. It's just you change one or two skills in your trinket loadout. So if you're looking for things you want to lock in, you know they're good. I would say Precise Striker. This one has Slugger, but I think Precise Striker is better just because Punish Critting and Exsanguinate Critting are both massive. So I like that if you're looking for a damage variant. Slugger's okay, but those are pretty much the two damage options you want. You don't want to do any of the range ones or deadly or something like that because who cares about buffing Reign of Stars? The under half health boosts for Quirks, those are actually good for him just because he's usually going to be spending a lot of time there. Other characters, you don't want them to get there, but for him, you're okay if he gets there. So having extra speed or extra crit when he's low health is nice. So those synergize pretty well with his normal playstyle. And on the other side of that coin, if you get the negative quirks that penalize you when you're low health, just get rid of those pretty much as soon as you can. They're not good on anyone, obviously, but for the same reason the positive variants are good, the negative variants are bad, just because he spends a lot of time at low health. So if you see them, try and get rid of them as soon as possible. For negative quirks, to maximize yourself here, if the flagellant gets mercurial, which lowers your virtue chance, just leave it on. Like, let it lock in. Hope it locks in, because he can never go virtuous, so... Because of that, that makes Mercurial basically a... a free... negative quirk slot that blocks something else bad from landing on you. And then consequently, if you see Irrepressible, then try and get rid of it, or at least don't lock it in, because he's just never gonna use it. Some other niche picks that are pretty solid are Resilient and Stress Faster. It's pretty easy to get him stressed out between Endure and Lash's Anger, for instance. So, being able to get more stress healing from sources, or not eating as much food when you're stressed out is pretty nice. That can save you in some instances. Like, if you have a stress eater and a stress faster, they kind of bounce out, which is nice. But I don't know if those are something I want to go out to lock in. Maybe resilient, but not so much stress faster, unless you're just saying, Hey, I'm going to lock in unyielding, stress faster, and just whatever else I'm trying to do for the Razor's Edge playstyle that I warned you against. So if you want to do that, go ahead. Natural might actually be a good trink or a good quirk for him. I was gonna say trinket, because natural is basically a quirk that acts as two trinkets, like its own trinket set. And I'm still thinking about it on this one. I haven't locked it in, but having extra hit points, healing received, and speed with no trinkets is pretty nice. Like it's not, it's pretty much everything he's looking for, in terms of uh, ability boosts. So one to consider if you get it early. You know, if you get it at, like level one and you want to spend the couple thousand gold to lock it in, maybe you have 20,000 gold on week 11, for instance, I would actually consider it, and then just not rock any trinkets, because natural is very good early, and it's kind of weak later, but it's still pretty effective on him. The last point, which I think is the most important, though, for quirks, is any of the defensive quirks are all good for him, because his damage comes from his bleed, which is very hard to increase the damage of outside of crits. All of the defensive quirks, uh, quirks are very good for him. So steady, hard skin, tough, unyielding, clotter. Clotter's amazing on him. All those are just solid lock-ins. Like if you locked in steady, hard skinned, and tough, or steady, tough, and clotter, something like that, your flagellant's gonna feel very good. It's gonna be very hard to bring him down at that point. It's gonna be very hard to stress him out, very hard to kill him. So any of the defensive ones are probably the safest uh, catch-all lock-in bets. And I did forget to talk about Luminous. Luminous and Quick Reflexes are always good. Lock those in, and then just be on your way. So we're gonna look at our teams, finally, which I feel is the bread and butter of these videos, but I also like to put it at the end, after you know how the hero operates. So for the Flagellant, there are a lot of variations to this team specifically. This is just a standard bleed setup. So you have your Flagellant in the front, because he gets the bleeds, and we're gonna use Punish, Reign of Sorrows, because this gives us the most bleed reach, bleed synergy here. It helps our Houndmaster a lot. Reclaim, just because it's good. And then Redeem, because I feel this should be on every Flagellant. And this covers a lot of bases. You get a heal and a pinch. Well, you get an extra heal, and then you get the pinch heal. And then you get a lot of access to damage. So there's a lot going on here. The Flagellant will use some combination of something like this. So I think the Flesh's Heart is almost mandatory if you want to use Reclaim, just because the extra hit points is never bad and then also the bleed resist makes it so he doesn't bleed himself this is just almost a instant slot in a lot of cases and then I like the ancestors ring I saw a tier list where this thing for trinkets was like near the bottom and I was trying to figure out why because I've had so many people when I made my quirk video talk about how good prod is and then I think 
having some measure of prot is always good just because it shaves off one damage on all those moves that do one damage among other effects and then the 10 accuracy is very important just because being able to hit stuff matters quite a bit especially with your reign of sorrows because there's some evasive backliners out there and the prot synergizes pretty well with the extra hit points so this covers a lot of bases because you don't need flat damage because he doesn't do great flat damage you want your bleed damage and if you're going somewhere that you know they can bleed pretty reliably then you don't have to worry about the bleed amulet so I think this covers a lot of bases it shores up his offense it makes him pretty tanky and it sets up uh, or it sets him up for success with the rest of your team behind him is gonna be the highwayman the loadout is going to be open vein because that is a bleed dual semantics and point blank mainly to fix positioning but this is a good shell combo you can even use the flagellant or not flagellant the highwayman in rank three if he's faster than your vestal because turn one he can duelist advance and then have access to all his other stuff then pistol shot is for coverage this way you can snipe the backliners because that is important so otherwise besides the crimson court set which i would always be screaming about to use i'm trying to show you some low level variants that you can put on if you don't have that set maybe you're not getting it in your blood moon playthrough what have you but this is a really solid set for bleeding and repose. So you get the surgical gloves, which gives you some accuracy, and the melee skills. The 10 debuff resist is almost negligible. The 20 move resist, the highwayman doesn't care because he has two movement skills to get him back to where he needs to be. I think dual savants, you can even use it from rank four. So you can just hit this a couple times if you get knocked to the back. So we don't really care about the movement resist. Can you stop talking? I need to look at this, all right? The Sharpening Sheath really boosts your Repost and your Open Vein to very awesome levels. So, at this point, it's pretty common to have some solid Repost crits, and your Open Veins are almost always going to stick. And then you just get minus one speed, but you're spamming Open Vein anyway, which lowers their speed. This isn't really a big trade-off, so I think this combo works very well together. It gives you, what, 15% bonus crit. So, base crit here, I have the building, so 13 and then open vein base crit is four. So what, 17 plus 15, 29% base crit. You know, I forget what the repose crit mass out to. I don't know if it shares the same one as uh, the duels advance flat, but you get what I'm saying. Like this is a good crit setup. And if you fight enemies that have multiple actions and cleaves and stuff, it just gets better. The Vestal, we're gonna use another low level setup. Otherwise this would be Salacious Diary and this would be the Ancestors map or some other support thing. But it's pretty easy to get this set up early. Like, this is a common trinket. And even though Junius Head is very rare, you can get this from a few locations. Well, two specific locations very easily. I'm not going to spoil. But, like, even the average player that I'm not spoiling, like the new player, is going to run across this pretty quickly, depending on what they're doing or how good their scouting is, for instance. So this is an easy set to get early, and it does a lot of effective healing and supporting ability. This is the best Vestal loadout for your support Vestal. Judgment is a very high tempo move. Stunning is never bad to have. And then you have the two heals. The group heal is probably your best skill. But the single target healing is really nice. So you're pretty much going to be hitting these alongside the stun. And then if you need to clean up a kill or heal the Vestal, this is the best thing to hit. Houndmaster. I'm going to give him a high level thing here. So this is the Crimson Quartz set. This set is amazing as it stands. And you have so much bleed synergy on this team that the Houndmaster is going to be putting out some very respectable damage. I think he's going to go up to like... 9 or 10 to, uh, what, like 15, 16, something like that. Very strong damage. And it's very easy to get bleeds going. And since the Flagellant has a higher base speed, it's very easy for him to go first. You can rain a Sorrows, the backline, and then send the dog to kill something. Like, it's almost guaranteed dead unless it has, like, 35 hit points or something. I'm looking at you pigs, because some of you do. The Evidence of Corruption is a great standalone trinket. Just because of the scouting chance and the minus surprise chance, this pretty much gives you a lot of the advantage even if you're playing in dark situations because scouting is how you offset the ambushes and then having minus chance for surprise is just awesome. And the minus 10 stress is kind of whatever. And for the Lawman's Badge, having extra accuracy is very important. The Houndmaster's two attack moves that aren't the Blackjack are range skills, so this helps out a lot. He has a lot of stress healing and camping, so that gives you a big boost. The healing skills are kind of whatever because I don't usually like to use like wounds unless I know I need all of the extra healing I can squeeze out. And then the stun resist and debuff resist does kind of suck. 
if you are in the Warrens, that frontline pig with the cleaver and the ball and chain is going to stun you pretty much every time, and that sucks. So we're just hoping to go first and maybe stun with the Vestal. Who knows? The abilities, though, Hound's Rush hits everything, and again, in the Warrens, this is very good because almost all the enemies are beast. It does have Merc Synergy, but we don't have a Merker on the team besides the Houndmaster, so we're not going to really depend on that, but it gives you more bleed. This lets the Houndmaster just double tap targets for big damage with the Crimson Court set, and then also synergize with all of the bleeding stuff we have going on. So if the boss has multiple actions, you're just stacking fat bleeds, they're taking 14, 27 damage a turn, what have you, and that's awesome. We like that. Hound's Harry is a good cleave move. Puts a strong bleed on pretty much, well I shouldn't say pretty much, it puts a strong bleed on everything. Three points is very nice if you can bleed everything. There are certain bosses that being able to cleave them like doubles your power or triples and in this case quadruples your power. So having the ability to do that is awesome. And as I said, it synergizes with all the other bleed stuff. And this is a good move to clean up enemies like low health kills where... For instance, you have an enemy that has like five hit points, they're bleeding for three, and you're going, okay, well, I don't want to just send the, the Hound's Rush into it and just waste all that extra damage. And then you can use Hound's Harry and just chip him down to that kill range. My voice gave out when I said range because I've been recording for like, I don't know, almost an hour and a half. Yeah. So Cry Havoc is a good stress heal. This pairs very well with Endure. Even though it is a percentage chance at max rank, it is pretty high. So if you hit this a couple times, you're usually guaranteed to get it. So if you hit Endure, and you hit this, you hit Endure, you hit this, you're healing a lot of stress pretty quickly on your team. I've had some people even say that this is better than the Jester's Inspiring Tune, which, kind of debatable, like you have to really see the math on the percentage chances and stuff like that. Like, if this hits four people, like if this hits three people, this is more effective stress healing. But then I believe the Jester has a stress resist buff on top of it, so... It's kind of hard to say which is better, but this is still very good, especially if you're going to throw your Houndmaster in the back. You can use variations, as I said, you can use two Houndmasters, and the Houndmaster in rank 2 instead of the Highwayman would probably use Blackjack. But there's a lot of flexibility in this team. You can move people around, you can use an Occultist instead of a uh, Vestal, and you have the flexibility of having the Flagellant be the extra healer so you don't get completely dunked by the zero heals from the occultist, and then you get Mark Synergy. So there's a lot that you can do here and trade people around. So just kind of be creative and think about it like, as long as someone can kind of replace some of the other stuff that I'm losing, then it's good. So <laughs> yeah, that, I, I guess that made sense, right? But this team is pretty simple to play. I usually start off the fight by using Reign of Sorrows on the back line just to get them bleeding out pretty quickly, especially with my high speed on the Flagellant. And then your Highwayman, if you're not using Duelist Advance from rank 3 or something, you don't quite want to use Open Vein on turn 1, so you're going to pistol shot into the back, try and clean up the rank 4, rank 3 kill. And then the Houndmaster can finish off whoever else is uh, out there. So now that my cat wants in, I guess you can hear him in the mic because someone told me they heard him on a different video. Um, but yeah, we're going to move on to the, the next team here. This next team is a Mark team, and it functions pretty well because being able to have a frontline healer lets the player, or I guess you in this case, pack the rest of the team with Mark Synergy because a lot of the good marking stuff is kind of mid-rank or back. You know, you could use Bounty Hunter rank 1 if you really wanted to and then Vestal somewhere else, but having the ability to put Mark characters in 2, 3, and 4 does help out. Actually, a lot of it gives you some good flexibility. So, for this team, the Flagellant is actually the main healer. And he's the main healer for the first half of the battle. And then it's going to switch over to the Arbalest. I have a Musketeer because I don't have a level 6 Arbalest right now. But with this setup, you're going to have Punish because you need a frontline attack. You're going to hope that your backline can kill the rest of the backline. And then Reclaim is what you're going to be hitting pretty much every turn, which is why you have the Flesh Heart. So you don't bleed yourself. And then you have Redeem. Which you can take off the Flesh Heart if you want to set up Redeem more often. And then this last one can be either Endure or Suffer or even Exsanguinate depending on what you're looking for. It would be Endure if you don't use something like the Tempting Goblet. I'm just trying to show where this would be applicable because the Flagellant can never go Virtuous. So having this minus 10% chance isn't a big deal. 
the ton of hit points and speed and dodge is very relevant. And then stress attacks don't hit the front too often. They can, but they don't. And you have two forms of stress healing on the team potentially, so having this isn't as big of a detriment. This team doesn't work very well in low torch just because uh, like one surprise can just destroy it. But for the most part, you know, if you can get around that or whatever, maybe you can take it there. And then uh, obviously the tempting goblet's like mega rare, so if you have something else, slide it in here. This could be pretty much anything else. This could be like an ancestor scroll, which would be okay too for uh, the endure. But then, you know, reclaim, not reclaim, endure, stressing you out gets a little high, so. I don't know. Weigh these options carefully. So next we're going to look at the Bounty Hunter. We have Uppercut to mess up positioning and stun the frontliners. And hopefully pull up some backliners that may not be very good in the front. You could use Come Hither instead if you wanted. But I think having one stun is usually good. Two stuns is actually better. But yeah, that's just your first option. Mark for Death. This really sets up your team for Mark Synergy. And being able to get the plus five speed on the bounty hunter for marking means if he gets to go first and he marks and then these two kill it then he gets to mark first next turn because he's got you know 12 speed at that point and he can really set the the flow of battle and so you have collect bounty for when he switches to frontline dps then you have caltrops this could be something else like this is replaceable but this really helps you kill you know bosses that may sit in the back or certain tough enemies or double space things and even if you don't bleed them, just the fact that they get the debuff for plus 20% damage taken and minus 8 speed, that pretty much makes them go last. So Caltrops is a good opener, and it's almost a pseudo mark, because if you hit Caltrops, they're going last, and then your Arbalest can get a shot off, and then she's guaranteed to get like the shot off before next turn. So there, there's a lot of utility in Caltrops, I like this move a lot. But otherwise, for Trinkets, we're going to use the Fortifying Garlic, just because having the Hunter's Talon, I think... This really just shores up the entirety of Bounty Hunter's damage. The only other thing I can think of is if you used maybe an Ancestor's Pen or some other melee damage, but this usually does enough by itself, specifically because of the accuracy in the crit. So make sure you take extra food. But as I was saying, since your damage is shored up by the Talon, having some kind of tank trinket like the Fortifying Garlic really keeps your Bounty Hunter alive up front so he doesn't have to worry about Blight and Bleed. Or the, the rare disease, but anything that gives hit points, dodge, like Feather Crystal, uh, could be useful, but this is just an idea. The Houndmaster is going to use a loadout similar to this. I think mark teams do better when at least two people can mark, so that way you never get stuck in the mud. Like, for instance, if this turn, or if the Houndmaster goes before the Bounty Hunter, then you still have someone to mark, and the Houndmaster does have the best mark in the game, so this is very relevant. And since he can use it to hit anything from anywhere, if you get through the rest of your team, or like the rest of the enemy, and they have like the rank 1 person, the Houndmaster can knock 30 prod off them because that's usually where the most protection is. But then also you have that massive base chance, so it's almost always going to stick. And your Musketeer slash Arbalist is probably healing at the back end of the fight. So this keeps facilitating offense, and it lets Collect Bounty get more, uh, more value. But... We have Cry Havoc, just because it's a decent stress heal, especially if you have Endure. This means that the Flagellant, using Endure to siphon stress off people, this helps keep him lower, because we do want to try and avoid Rapturous. And then we have the two attacks. The times I've not used Hound's Harry, I've missed it, so I think this is actually a very good move. Like, I knew it was good, but I've tried to use other stuff, like the Guard or Lick Wounds, and sometimes Blackjack if I'm at the front, but I always find myself missing this attack, so it's pretty hard to justify getting rid of. And then we have Hound's Rush just to go in on the, the Mark Synergy further and just do a bunch of extra damage. Very good single target damage, especially if they are Beast. For Trinkets, there's a lot of stuff you can use, just anything offensive or anything that boosts Bleed Chance, like a Bleed Amulet is solid. I still think the Crimson Court set is just too amazing to pass up, so I just put it on there. But really anything that gives damage is good, because in this comp, the Houndmaster is pretty much a damage dealer, or if you wanted to, maybe like a debuff amulet to stick the mark, but you really don't need to. So, just whatever gives you more damage per turn, probably just slap that in. Usually accuracy. The Musketeer 
slash arbalist. I keep getting them just switch just because I'm staring at the musketeer, but you use sniper shot or aim shot depending on which one you're using. They're both the same, and this is just your primary damage dealer. So you just mark, make sure you go last, shoot them, do a lot of damage, hope for a crit. Buckshot slash bola, this is just to cleave the front line so you have some attack that hits up there. You could use sidearm or blind fire, but this cleave and the movement effect, sometimes it is good and sometimes relevant, so it, this is okay, but this can be swapped out for a lot of things. Patch up slash battlefield bandage is almost, it, like, it is the second thing you're taking for sure, just because having access to a second healer is very nice, plus the healing receive buff means that reclaim is going to heal for that extra 38%, which comes out to a couple damage. I think one or two, I think it boosts it to like five or six, I can't remember which, but this is good. So consider always having this on and the way this team operates is, as I was saying, the back line, your back line, so your Houndmaster and your Arbalest, they're gonna kill the enemy back line. And then after they're dead, then the Arbalest slash Musketeer is gonna swap to hitting bandage every turn while the Flagellant helps clean up the rest of the kills, the Flagellant and the, the Bounty Hunter, so. Your priority is to kill the back and then kill the front and then use these turns to heal and recover. Which is why we have Skeet Shot or Rallying Flare, they both do the same thing in this. And like the minus stress is why you want this. The clear mark, clear stun is good, but not always applicable. And the bonus torch does save you some gold. So if you know you're gonna be hitting this consistently in a dungeon, you can just take less torches and then hit this every every fight and get one tile of light back, so. It's not bad. In the long run, it's pretty good. It saves you a couple torches if you hit it consistently. For trinkets, we're going to use the Legendary Bracer. It's specifically because of the minus speed. This way, the Arbless is always going or hoping to go after our marker every single time, especially after the Bounty Hunter gets a speed boost because then you're just not going to outpace him, especially with the Bracer. And this is just a lot of damage for kind of low penalty. I think this is good i think the brace is only good in a handful of situations but in those situations where it's good it is very good so i like it on our snipers vulse tassel could be something else i i think it just works well here because it's accuracy and marked but there are a lot of other things that give accuracy and damage and sometimes crit that you can cycle around or you can use a crimson court set if you want there's just a lot of options here but this is uh, what I think gets you a lot of bonus damage. This is like plus 40% damage against Marked. And at rank 5, that's 140% damage against Marked. And all this bonus crit, so it's, it's a lot of damage. This is really good at chunking down bosses that have, you know, good HP pools that sit in the back, especially if they have low prot. But then you do have something that gets rid of prot. Actually, you have two Marks that get rid of prot. That's pretty cool. But otherwise, instead of the Houndmaster, you could take a second Arbalist if you're feeling spicy. I just think the Houndmaster fills too many weaknesses in this team, so I usually don't want to get rid of them. Especially the camp skills. Houndmaster has great camp skills like Hound's Watch and uh, the Scouting, which I don't have unlocked on this one, but I have it on others. So, As I was saying, the easiest way to play this team is to use the Mark, shoot up the back, get rid of those and then after you clear out the back then just start recovering and shooting the front or oh, hitting the front I should say it's pretty simple to play it's a nice mark team and just to reiterate the way or I should say the reason this does pretty well is because you have a frontline healer which enables a lot more mark synergy than having to do something like Vestal rank 3 and like Occultus rank 1 or some some kind of weird amalgamation or whatever of mark synergy just to get it across so, I like this team. The third team is a heavy sustain team, or super sustain is what I've been calling it. And this is a very easy to play team and it just focuses on not dying. Because you have a lot of access to healing and stress healing. So you could actually switch one of these for endure if you really wanted to. But I don't think you need to because of the other two stress healers. But Having Punish in Reign of Sorrows gives you some good damage options. Reclaim, I think, is just amazing, so why get rid of it? And Redeem is always solid. If you wanted to get rid of Reclaim, which you could do, 
You could pitch the Flesh's Heart and take Exsanguinate over Redeem, or Reclaim, I should say. I always get these mixed up. And just get all this extra damage potential. So it is pretty good. And with the amount of recovery on this team, it should last you. Or you should be able to stay alive pretty easily. And it's very nice. Uh, otherwise, we're going to use the Martyr Seal just to keep us alive in case we do hit Death's Door. And then on top of the Flesh Heart, that's 30% hit points and a lot of extra damage. Like I said, the Martyr Seal is pretty much insurance, but this can be swapped out. And then the Flesh's Heart can be swapped out depending on what you're using. There's a lot of options here, so you can get like Bleed Chance, uh, Accuracy, Flat Damage if you really wanted to. Just, I don't know, the world's kind of your oyster at this point. Or even some of the Thing from the Star, Thing, Things? Thing from the Star's Trinkets, there you go. Because a lot of those work when you're low health, and ironically enough, or maybe not ironically, but... The Flagellant spends a lot of time at low hit points, and he will be able to activate those pretty successfully. Next is the Crusader, who gets to enjoy a healthy damage setup. So we have the Ancestor's Pen, because we have the Jester, so we're not too concerned with accuracy. It is a problem, but not too bad. The Jester does fill a lot of weaknesses, so we have Ancestor's Pen just for the raw damage of it. All of the... Crusader attacks that are worth using are, in fact, melee. Zealous Accusations is range, but why are you using this? This is not Butcher Circus. The non-Euclidean Hilt is really good for the hit points. And, you know, if you get the stun skill chance, that's just a bonus. Like, it's pretty common to carry Holy Water. The Crusader always brings one. So you always have one starting out in your inventory. But also... If you're not in the ruins, because you have the flagellant, that means the holy water is probably staying in your inventory for a very long time, which means you have a lot of good stun chance. But then the chance to blight is also just extra damage. Like, treat this as the crusader's base damage is 12 to 19, or even 14 to 23. Not 12 to 19, 12 to 21. Or 14 to 23, because you get the, the four points of blight if it sticks. So it's really good, and it really helps if you want to use Holy Lance, and Holy Lance doesn't squeeze out that kill. You do Blight them for two turns, so maybe you'll get it. And being able to use Stunning Blow with a Blight is amazing. So this is definitely worth the 200 shards or whatever it is. The chance to randomly attack something is not even the end of the world, because if the Crusader accidentally swings a Smite or a Stun into the back line, do you really care? I don't, unless you hit a corpse, but otherwise... It's good. So you're gonna use Smite just because it's a solid frontline attack, just hit stuff. Stunning Blow is just a great stun, and the damage penalty is pretty minor, and it's got pretty high accuracy, so Crusader's accuracy problems are a little more manageable, especially with the Battle Ballad. We have Holy Lance to fix positioning, and Holy Lance is just a great move, especially now that it can hit rank two with its fat crit modifier, so we like that. You could even consider starting, no actually, I was going to say you could consider starting Crusader in rank 3, but Jester can't do much from rank 2 besides like, finale. <laughs> so we'll look at Jester in a second here. But Inspiring Cry, this move is just amazing. It covers so many things, it gets people off Death's Door, it reduces stress, it gives you Torch. It gives you more Torch than a hallway tile, even in Blood Moon, so. Using this a couple times will save you a lot of gold, especially if you take this team often. Really good. Jester. We have Finale in case we get scrambled, otherwise we have no way to get up there. This is just like a, in case you get surprised or pulled, especially later in the fight, you just tap Finale and hopefully like gank something and then just flee to the back and sit there the rest of the fight. Slice off or Harvest, either one's applicable, or Dirk Stab if you really want to make use of Finale. Those are both good, or Solo. This is probably your most flexible spot, but I think Slice off is slightly better than Harvest in most cases. So, uh, we're using that. Battle Ballad is amazing. This is the best Jester button. People think it's Inspiring Tune. I would actually debate against that. I think Battle Ballad is just so good as a button. You can stack it. You get a ton of speed. You get a ton of accuracy. You get a ton of crit. It's just good. It helps you kill things faster. And getting crits is stress relief. So, you're probably using your first, like, three turns doing this because it's just that good. Inspiring Tune is good if they start getting kind of high stress, especially if you're doing something like Farmstead. Inspiring Tune is really good there. But otherwise, unless the boss or 
the run is putting down a lot of stress. You usually only use this a couple times in a dungeon, which is still good. It saves you a lot of money in the long run. But if you're not playing in Darkest, stress is more manageable, especially if you're using stuns. So this does get some use, but it's not as good as Battle Ballad in most cases. But I mean, sometimes it's just good to have this. Sometimes you eat a couple crits in a row, even in Max Torch, and you just get unlucky. So being able to knock off some stress so people don't get afflicted is good. So this is a good fourth move to use. For Trinkets, we're going to go with the Ancestor's Coat just for the dodge. And we're going to have like a mini dodge tank here, but this can be a lot of things. This can be a support trinket or some other defensive trinket or a bleed amulet just so you can land those slice offs. But yeah, you just have a lot of choices here. So I guess when we get to the Jester Guide, we'll be able to explore more of them. But I think this is a pretty good catch all as a, a trinket. This keeps you alive. And there's some really good low level dodge trinkets. Like I think Camouflage Cloak does the same thing. You just get the minus stun resist or something like that. So that's kind of a good replacement. But look around, there's some good options here. The second trinket is going to be a tambourine, depending on what light level you're playing in. But usually the bright tambourine gets you some pretty solid utility. It helps your inspiring tune get up to, I think, 14 stress relief. And then your stress penalty from the Ancestor's Coat is negated. So as long as you're staying in high light, this thing is very awesome. There are a lot of other things you probably could slot here, but I think one of the tambourines is usually best. Like, they're just really good items. Then I click on the Vestal and I wonder why we're looking at the Vestal. Because it's always the same, it's Salacious Diary, it's the map, or some other support trinket. This could be a survival guide, this could be a Chirurgeon's Amulet, or Charm, or whatever. You've heard me say it probably like eight times at this point. I don't even know, I've lost count. And then this is the best Vestal loadout, so... You're just hitting heals, hitting stuns, hitting Judgment, because Judgment's a high tempo move. The way to play this team is pretty simple. You use the Reign of Sorrows to start shredding the back line and killing them over probably about two or three turns especially if one of the other characters can get in there and get a, a solid hit then usually you're taking them down pretty quickly but usually two reign of sorrows will solo a back line in three turns maybe four depending on how strong the enemies are and since it cleaves if there are things like the pink fish if you took the flagellant to the cove being able to bleed them is helpful especially because they sit in stealth or if you're outside the ruins, there are a lot of other things that bleed pretty reliably. So you're starting off your first turns trying to bleed them out. Your Crusader is rotating stuns on the front line to keep them managed. And your Jester is just hammering away at that guitar to get your stats up and get some crits. And hope you, not hope, help you kill stuff much more quickly. And then throwing in the occasional slice off or inspiring tune. And then the Vessel is just hitting heals and hitting stuns. And if you have a couple solid stuns, like Dazzling Light's okay, Stunning Blow's a little better. And if you're using those consistently, especially if you have like the stun boost from the Euclidean Hilt, you're able to keep people stunned and get a couple extra heals out. So this team does excel at stalling for the end of battles. And if you're not doing that, it's probably not going to feel as effective. So definitely try and maximize your turns if you're like, Okay, there's just one person that's going to attack me, the other person's stunned, I'm only going to take about 10 damage if they swing into me, and this way I can use 2 or 3 turns to heal, you know, like 20 stress. It's good. So always be looking for ways to get those extra turns to get stress off. This team does pretty good against bosses, especially if they don't shuffle you, because you can just wear them out. And if they have multiple actions per turn, they get bled out pretty hard. And then you also have a finale. You could even just use move on the Crusader and just move him back a space to put Jester in rank 2 and then just tap Finale and do, you know, like 80 damage if you have it charged up. It can do more if it crits too. Actually, I think it crits into like 80, but you can crit for like triple digits if it's built up all the way, so definitely make use of that. This last team is actually one of my favorites. If you watched my worst run ever video that I posted a couple weeks ago, this team got dunked by the Shambler, but that's because I misplayed. It actually handled the Shambler pretty well, but I made some misplays, and I had no experience with the team yet. It was the first time I took it out, and I thought, you know what, I'll just run it through Darkness. It should be fine. Darkness champion in the wield, and it did actually pretty good there besides the Shambler, which I screwed up on. It wasn't the team's fault, so the team relies on pretty much the Occultist. He's like the engine of the team, the MVP for the most part. 
But having a frontline healer again in the the flagellant is really nice. It helps the occultist not get people killed when he rolls it too. And you have some consistent healing in the way of either exsanguinate for yourself or redeem for allies. And you could use reclaim if you want, but I think this is more of a damage focused flagellant build. And so we're going to use both low hit point things because this is kind of a martyr setup. I don't think you should sit at death's door the entire time. It's just too easy to die. You have like a 15% chance. But otherwise, you know, you can sit at low health pretty reliably. And having the three attacks that he has access to just gives you a lot of damage options. And then as I've been saying for like every build, redeem is nuts. So you never take that off. I think it's just too good to pass up. The trinkets, you can use a martyr seal just because it is a martyr build. So you're probably very close to dying or dying a lot of the time. And then the things mesmerizing eye, I'm just showing off some other stuff. You're going to be spending a lot of time at low health, so being able to get 8% crit and reliably not die that easily because you have the Martyr Seal and the bonus death blow for being a flagellant makes this a really solid setup. It's lacking accuracy, so you have to be careful of what you're hitting. So you could slot something else out for accuracy if you really wanted, like one or the other, but I think the mesmerizing eye is probably the easiest to get rid of. I think the Martyr Seal is just too important with the, the nature of this team, and you're going to see here in a sec. The Occultist, however, we're not talking about the Martyr Seal anymore. This is the engine of this team. The main reason is Hands of the Abyss, or Hands from the Abyss, is just an amazing move. This thing is so good. Like, for the longest time when I've been playing Darkest Dungeon, I've been making YouTube videos, I get comments, people go, Rank 2 Occultist, Hands from the Abyss, his stun is amazing. I'm sitting here like, are you sure? You know, because you're putting a, a very fragile person in the front line, you know. But it turns out this thing is incredible. It's got really good base accuracy at 110. Minus 50% damage mod is kind of whatever in the grand scheme of things because you have 13% bonus crit. This thing is always critting, it feels like. It hits very hard. And when you crit, you get a plus 20% chance to stun stuff. So when you crit, your stun base is actually 170. And this thing is very capable of double stunning enemies. Like, especially if they have less than 90% stun resist. And even if they have 90% stun resist, you can still do it. So between having a stun trinket and that, you can keep something locked down for like two turns, very reliably, and it's awesome. The Minus Torch does kind of suck, but if you use the Crimson Quartz set, which operates in low light, let's actually look at the, the set here. So I got it back, the Shrieker showed up finally. So you get some bonus speed and low torch. I think this is critical. You don't even have to play at zero light, you can just play at half light, that's still really good. And the, the minus HP does suck. The minus bleed chance makes it so weird reconstruction doesn't bleed your heroes, which is awesome. And then plus 25% damage at low torch is kind of whatever. But then you get 15 dodge. So you get to dodge tank stuff, which does synergize with the Antiquarian. The Vial of Sand is the other second choice if you're not using stuff like I have right now. This just gives the Occultist the ability to do pretty much everything in his moveset. And uh, then you get the 15 dodge. And what's weird is... Someone pointed this out to me. The uh, Occultist, I was going to say Flagellant. The Occultist does not get a class trinket that boosts healing. That's like, what the heck, Red Hook? Because Occultist is actually treated as a healer. We all treat him as some kind of support because he has a lot of utility moves. But I invite you to look at his crit buff, which gives him bonus healing. Which means Red Hook thinks he's a healer, yet he has no bonus healing trinkets. So the best healing trinket you can give him is probably the Ancestor Scroll. Where is it? There it is. So if you want some kind of healing output, then use this. Otherwise, we are going to use the Demon's Cauldron. If we're not using the Crimson Quartz set, the plus 3% crit is massive. The 40 debuff chance is massive. That helps weakening curse stick to stuff. The plus 30 stun skill is massive. Shuffle, why do you keep saying massive? Because it's freaking massive. It's so strong. It was a really good item. Like, when I made the tier list video a year ago, I kind of... I don't want to say slept on it, but I just didn't use rank 2 occultist that much, but then I started using it consistently with this team, and it's incredible. So make sure that you have some kind of stress heal going on for your occultist, because, you know, he's not virtuing with this thing pretty much. And then I have the feather crystal just to get a boost of speed. Anything that gives you speed is pretty good. I don't think the quick draw charms are that good, but the reason you want speed is because this team needs to set up. It needs occultist and antiquarian to go early, if not first in order to get everything it wants to do done. 
So when you get to go first, you get to slam the hands from the Abyss on turn one and stun very threatening enemies. You get eight dodge to keep dodge tanking. And then after that, you can always just use a heal early in the round or a mark early in the round or a curse early in the round. And it lets your occultist really dictate what's happening in the battle. And since you have the flagellant who can potentially heal, on top of that, the occultist doesn't have to do all the heavy lifting with reconstruction. He can do what he's better at, which is facilitating offense. So I think having some form of speed and stun chance is really what you need for this team. But there's some there's some options here. Otherwise, I would say the Crimson Quartzet is probably a close second. The Houndmaster is going to use something lower level in this case. Like, Ancestor Trinkets are high level, but this just to give you an idea. There is like a green trinket that increases ranged accuracy. It's like the Steady Bracer or something. So you can use that in place of it, but having 10 accuracy and 10 prot is pretty nice. 10% stress isn't a big deal because you have stress healers. Well, actually, the occultist, not the occultist, the uh, the houndmaster is the stress healer. So having extra accuracy shores up your chance to hit, which is nice, especially against some of the more evasive enemies. And then the bleed amulet is just to stick bleeds because houndmaster damage goes pretty much in the gutter if you're not landing bleeds. Like if you don't bleed, you feel like the Houndmaster is just doing like 8 damage a turn, and it just feels like garbage. But otherwise, if you're going to play this team in Darkness, you need the Crimson Court set. It's almost non-negotiable, just because the extra scouting chance and the minus surprise chance means this team doesn't get completely dunked every time it runs into uh, some random hallway battle. Shambler will still scramble you, but other than that. For skills, we have the Hound's Rush, just because direct damage hits everything from almost anywhere. And it's really nice, especially if the Occultist can spend a turn to drop a mark. Then this does a lot of damage. Makes it pretty good against killing bosses as well, especially if they have no protection. Hound's Harry, the same thing. Like, the cleave is just too good to pass up. Every time I feel like I don't need it and I take it off, I wish I had it. So, definitely use that. Cry Havoc, this is some good stress healing. Especially in lower light levels where stress is more common. And if you're using things that increase stress taken like certain trinkets then this is almost almost a necessity but you can likely swap this out for the mark or lick wounds or something or blackjack depending on what you want but you have the occultist stunning so you don't really need blackjack at that point guard dog this gives your team two guards with the antiquarian and having two guards means that the flagellant with redeem and reclaim if you do use it or the occultists with reconstruction only have two targets they consistently need to be hitting with it which means that the group heal advantage of the vestal is pretty much by the wayside at that point so unless you're fighting a boss that is spamming cleaves or i guess certain enemies that have cleaves uh, guard dog does make it very easy to keep your healing directed at the right people and keep you topped off and then also if you're playing in low light i forgot to talk about this the camp skills of the houndmaster are just incredible release the hound not as efficient as the Grave Robber Night Moves for scouting because it's 4 points for 30 instead of like 2 points for, I don't know, whatever hers is. What is it? 20? Yeah. The Houndmasters is less efficient on points, but it's still good. And then you have the Hound's Watch, which Nighttime Ambush Preventer, and then Minus Surprise Chance, very good at low light settings. The Antiquarian is the other part of the engine. For this team, the Occultist is like 90% of the engine, and then Antiquarian is like 5% after that, but she does fill some roles. So Antiquarian, you can use Nervous Stab or Festering Vapors, depending on what you're up against. Festering Vapors, I think, comes out to more damage, especially if you use the Crimson Quartz set. But then Nervous Stab is just consistently an okay 5 to 9, and if they have Prot, you just cry. But it has some pretty good range, and she can use it from anywhere, so it's not too bad. But Vapors can be used anywhere. So I think Vapors is still the slightly better move in most cases, but you have options here. So just take one of the attacks. I don't think you need Get Down. I think Flash Powder is probably just her worst move, because why use Flash Powder when you can use Vapors? But sometimes, especially if you have the floor and like we do, Flash Powder can be good if you're up against like a big single target thing. Like there's some big single target bosses that take, you know, two or three spaces and you can just slam debuff shredding over and over on top of the dodge spam and then uh, just not die. Really good against single target, not good against hallway battles, so plan accordingly. The Fortifying Vapors, this is another 
heal primarily to get people off death door. This means the occultist can't roll a zero and get someone killed. But the bleed and blight resist is very relevant. This is a solid heal, especially with some healing boost trinkets. Invigorating vapors is just one of the reasons you take antiquarian. This move is ridiculous. You stack it three times and your party's sitting at like 50 to 70 dodge. And uh, even in darkness, they're going to have like a 50, 60% chance to hit you. And if you use two antiquarians or like a man at arms or something like that, your dodge gets to ridiculous levels. This move is amazing. So we're going to use that. Protect me is the skill that enables the martyr setup. This is why the antiquarian is like 5% of the engine. And it lets the flagellant get marked and he gets to guard even though he doesn't normally get to guard and with that the flagellant is hopefully targeted by a lot of things and as he gets targeted it activates his martyr seal or it activates his low hit point abilities it activates his damage and it turns him into a pretty solid offensive beast by having some extra dodge and prot even though you want him to get hit it does slow down the damage a little bit so he doesn't get shredded in a couple turns and I think it's pretty good and as I was saying, along with the Houndmaster Guard Dog, this lets you get two guards on your team for almost free. You know, you only get three uses of this, but having two guards on your team is helpful for your healing output, because you know who you're supposed to heal. My only complaint about this is, even with the Mark and the Guard, I feel like the enemies just never target the Mark character. I feel like they rarely target the Antiquarian, and they kind of target the Flagellant even with the Mark. I, I've had instances, I think, where like I'm in the Warrens and the tentacle worm thing, instead of devouring the flagellant with the mark and the the thing, it does like weak and prey on the occultist, and I'm like, okay, Red Hook, I see you. <laughs> Trying to skirt my my flawless offense here, but this is a, a good move. And it's a shame you only get three uses of it, so if you're going to go to a boss battle, make sure you know that this can go the distance like it needs about 90 percent uptime or something at that point so definitely plan accordingly knowing what the bosses do beforehand does help a lot with this for trinkets we're gonna use the candle of life extra hit points are never bad and the healing skills boost i think makes fortifying vapors up to five health per cast which is okay like it's it's not bad it's almost Divine Grace without healing trinkets level, just like two points behind, two to four points, so it's okay. Like five five hit points is better than three, but this could be something else if you feel more creative or if you want to use the Crimson Quartet, for instance. The one I feel is almost non-negotiable, unless you have the Crimson Quartet, is the Fleet Florin, and it's really just the speed. So the debuff skill chance is nice, but if you're not using Flash Powder, it's worthless. And having four speed Alongside the occultist having two speed or four speed depending on what he's using Let's these two go first. They are very fragile. So an early protect me To protect her from the front line or whatever other snipers are out there Usually only the stress nukers are very quick So things like crossbow skeletons or whatever other range options are out there. They're usually slower than stress nukers So being able to go first and set up is awesome but if you wanted to use the Let's see, the uh, the Crimson Quartz set. You still get 4 speed and 10 dodge. So the Crimson Quartz set is also really good. So if you're going to use the Festering Vapors, this is a solid option. But this is pretty easy to get in most playthroughs. So I would shoot for that. You know, if you get the Crimson Quartz set, good. Try and rock that. But otherwise, this gives you a lot of flexibility. And as I was saying before, you get to set up before the opponent does too much damage to you. The way to play this team is to spend the first turn with Occultist and Antiquarian using the Occultist stun and the Antiquarian guard in order to establish your defenses, stunning a threatening target and then guarding the Antiquarian from something else and forcing them to attack the Flagellant is just awesome. The Flagellants and the Houndmaster will target whatever is threatening in the enemy lineup if it's not a boss because usually the boss is the threatening enemy, but in hallway and room battles they will target either whatever backline enemy is more dangerous or sometimes a frontline enemy. Usually it's the backline enemies because they have stress, so if you can bleed them and focus fire them, you'll get through them in a couple turns. Especially if the occultist can spend a turn marking, then it really sets up the Houndmaster, especially with his bonus speed. Well, the occultist bonus speed, I should say, because he should be going first. And after you do that, hopefully your dodge tanking ability 
as well as your solid direct damage and stuns will help you keep the front line in check while they try and beat your face in, but half the time they're going to be stunned and half the time they're going to be missing you. So ideally, you're just taking zero damage. No, you're going to get hit, but, you know, jokes aside, uh, this team does have a lot of control and it has a lot of defense in the way of dodge, so keeping the occultist and the antiquarian safe are the number one priorities. So if you need to make a suboptimal play so you can keep one of them, like, healthy, don't be surprised if you have to do that because they are very critical to making this team work. And I don't think you can really replace anyone. You know, like, this is a flagellant guy, so we're using him. And I don't really think the Houndmaster is easily replaced on this team because he just fills a lot of the, the weaknesses with the second guard and the mark synergy and the bleed synergy and the stress healing that... Replacing the Houndmaster is just not easy. You know, you have to be able to justify what you're losing. All right, y'all, that's going to do it. That was a doozy of a guide, but it was fun. I'm glad to have this done. I thought this was going to be shorter than the other ones, but it turns out when you have like four teams and a lot to talk about with the Flagellant, especially his unique abilities, there's just a lot to cover. So I hope you stuck with it, or if you had to come back and watch it a couple times, I understand. Some of my longer videos when I check on YouTube, I'll have like, you know, 80% unique viewers, which means people are coming back to watch it or like watch parts of it a second time. But otherwise, I know it's a lot to take in and digest, so I appreciate you spending that time with me. Next, we're gonna be talking about the Jester. People were asking for that one, and I think he's pretty cool. So he should be fun to cover and make teams for. He's kind of linear in certain ways. He really just has like support or finale, or sometimes some kind of overlap between them, so. The team's section may not be as in-depth as something like the Flagellant or the Grave Robber, for instance. You know, Shieldbreaker had some pretty limited teams, but the Jester is really just drop into rank 3 or 4 and then just, you know, be supportive until you need a finale. But there's some nuance there, so there's a little bit to explore, and then explaining him is going to be fun. So I hope you stick around for that. And uh, after that, probably the Arbalest. People are asking for that too, so if there are other guides you want to see, let me know, otherwise I'm just going in a predetermined order that I've already written out, unless I hear something otherwise. And look for these every, maybe every month, or every couple weeks, depending on how fast I can do it. I've been spending a lot of time with the Butcher's Circus content, and that's been very interesting, and people seem to like it, so I'm very thankful. If you are cool enough to have a Discord account, which you don't have to be cool enough, I mean, everyone just, you know, you can just sign up, right? You can just be someone that clicks sign up and create account and if you have discord installed then you can join our lovely discord we have over a hundred people it's kind of active it's pretty nice and people can come talk to each other or talk to me we're talking a lot about butcher circus and the base game so make sure you bring your lovely self there and come say hi otherwise i think that's it for this video actually i know that's it because this is almost two hours at this point so Thanks for watching. Hit the like, comment, subscribe, all that garbage. I don't I don't think it works, but people say it works, so I'm just gonna say it and then join Discord. And uh I'll see you later.